Good morning. Good morning. Mark chapter 4, starting in verse 1. A new chapter feels really good for me. So it felt like we spent three years in the first two chapters. So, verse 1. Again he began to teach by the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him, nothing new for Jesus and his ministry, so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land, and he was teaching them many things in parables. And in his teaching, he said to them, listen, behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell alongside the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up, and since it had no depth of soil... Uh, and when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see, but not perceive, may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all of the parables? The sower sows the word, and these are those along the path where the word is sown. And when they hear, Satan immediately comes and he takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, they immediately receive it with joy, but have no root within themselves, endure for a while, and then tribulation or persecution arises on the account of the word, and immediately they fall away. And others are sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of the riches and desire for other things enter in and choke the word. It proves unfruitful. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word, accept it, bear fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold. 20 verses was a lot, but let's pray. God, we... Pray that this story and explanation of your son, Jesus, uh, would take root in our heart today. That you would teach us something new, cause us, to deep, uh, cause us to think deeper and to ask deeper questions. Allow our imaginations to be stirred up within us so that we could see the kingdom of God, your plan, your will for our lives on this earth. In Jesus' name, and everybody said... Amen. My son, Ruckus, is possibly the most inquisitive of all of my children. Um, I was used to the million and one questions having young kids, but his questions have recently become deeper and deeper and deeper. And I don't know if maybe it's just maybe the like season of life he's in, or maybe he's just a deep thinker in general. Um, I, I grew up reading the, the book Pilgrim's Progress about the story, uh, an allegorical story of a man who is on this journey to this celestial city, and it just parallels the journey of what it means to follow Jesus and the trials of, of getting to heaven and what it looks like. And so we bought a, uh, actually it was from my mom's library, we, we brought to him a uh, a child's version. It's called The Dangerous Journey. And so it was a chapter book, and every night before bed, I would read him The Dangerous Journey. And afterward, I started to realize he was asking really deep questions about life and the meaning of it, and heaven, and dimensions, and eternity, and death. And as he would ask these questions as a five year old, I would try to give him five year old answers. And it just wouldn't suffice. He asked us the other day, Dad, you said that, that Jesus gave you these kids. Speaking of him and his siblings. And he goes, well, what did Jesus look like when he gave us to you? And I was like, 
well, he looked like Jesus. And he's like, but what does Jesus look like? You said he gave him to you. I'm like, well, and the other question was, hey, can you see heaven from where we are now? And I'm like, well, it's dimensional. It's, you know, there's some things. But, but Christian in the book, he saw the celestial city for himself. And I'm like, yeah, but let me explain. And so he gets deeper and deeper and deeper. And now he's asking questions about procreation. And I'm like, son, please just calm down. <laughs> You're five. What I started to realize as my kids ask deep questions is that deep questions make me uncomfortable. Deep questions, especially from strangers or even acquaintances, even friends, I guess, if I'm being honest, and especially of my children, don't always sit right. It's like, I don't really want to go there with you. I don't really have the answer. It's the deep, deep thoughts that scare us, and it's the deep questions and, and inquiries of our children and of our friends that put us all off guard. Like, that's not really, like, table talk. You don't meet someone the first time over coffee and, and are just, like, asking these ethereal, like, deep, like, theological questions. What do you start with? It's nice weather out today, right? Like, we want to keep it at the surface as much as possible. And those deep moments are for friends that have deep relationships with. And then there's Jesus, who is no longer welcome in the synagogue. He's taken his pulpit on a boat out in the Sea of Galilee with the shore full of a crowd of people, and he's giving his messages. And he has gone from reading scriptures and speaking to only speaking in parables. In fact, for the next several chapters, all we're going to see of Jesus is these stories. And I love that Mark stopped and, 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 and kind of paused. He, he tells the story of the sower. Here's Jesus. And then he's paused and he's like, and then Jesus went and explained to his disciples why he's going to talk like this from now on. He says, he began to teach by the sea, verse 1. A very large crowd gathered, verse 2. He's teaching them many things in parables. And listen in verse 3, he says, listen, behold. In other words, he's calling people to please lean in and try to do what you can to grasp what I am about to to say. As soon as he's done with the story, the disciples pull him aside when he is alone and go, what the heck, Jesus? You were talking plainly, you were talking about this kingdom, and you were talking about prophecy, and you were casting out demons and performing miracles. A miracle is easy to believe. You were blind, and, and now you see. You couldn't walk, and now you can. You were mute, and now you can speak. You were dead, and that little girl's now alive. But now, Jesus, you're talking in stories, and we're not really sure what has shifted. I love what one author said. He said, a parable is a light story with a heavenly weight. It literally means para to throw something alongside something else. It's like when you're prepping meals for your children. Like, you throw the dino nuggets next to the carrot sticks in hopes that they get the carrot sticks in the diet, too. This is Jesus. What he has to say about the kingdom and heaven and eternity and God's plan on planet Earth is not palatable for the everyday Jew. And so he's throwing these grand, great ideas right alongside the common man's language. Here's something that I know all of you are familiar with, sowing seed. They are Jews in an agriculture uh, environment. They're all used to seeing a sower go to the field and cast his seed all over his field and then plowing it afterward. This was common occurrence. This would be like saying red or green chili in New Mexico. We all get it. We're all familiar with it. It is not something that is confusing to us. Jesus is speaking in everyday plain language on the surface, but then beneath it, he is describing something that none of us can really comprehend. God's kingdom. Often he was asked, Jesus, tell us about the kingdom. And what the Jews had in their mind is an army usurping an insurrection, a, a, a revolution where Jesus would be king and enthroned over Rome and the empire and, and Israel would take its place again as God's chosen and it would be amazing. And then Jesus is like, well, it's nothing like that at all. So let me just tell you, the kingdom of heaven is kind of like a, a mustard seed. The kingdom of God is like a, 
like a housewife who loses a coin and she sweeps and looks for. The kingdom of God is like, and he continues with parable after parable after parable. And the reality is, he has to speak in parables because if Jesus described the kingdom of God as it was to the people who expected something completely different from him, they would have rejected him. They couldn't swallow it. They couldn't understand that. And so what does he do? He throws these grand, deep ideas, concepts, and descriptions of a kingdom right alongside a story everyone can get, but also a story that leaves us wanting, thinking, and pondering more. One theologian put it this way, Jesus was the master of teaching in parables. His parables often have an unexpected twist or surprise ending that catches everyone's attention. They are cleverly designed to draw listeners into new ways of thinking, new attitudes, and new ways of acting. He's all alone with his disciples, and he says, I gotta tell you why I gotta talk like this. And it kind of curtails right on what Pastor Josh preached on last Sunday. Some people among us, especially the religious elite, have already made up their minds about me. They cannot receive, they will not listen, they can see but not perceive, they will hear but not listen, they will experience but, but not enjoy. They're not going to get it no matter what happens. And so he starts with a story of soils, four different kinds of soils. And he says, I'm going to speak in parables because to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God and to others they will never be able to receive. I think the question that the disciples asked immediately after he gives this parable is, Jesus, why can't you be more forthcoming, straightforward? Why can't you just get to the point? Like, why can't we just take up the arms and, like, and storm the castle? Like, Jesus, what, is, where, what are we missing? Why are we skirting around the subject here? And, and I think what Jesus is doing, if I get this right throughout the first few chapters of the book of Mark, is that Jesus is giving these stories to his disciples and to his followers because he intends for them to walk away and continue thinking about it. Like Jesus isn't like A plus B equals C. Jesus is like, there might not be an A or a C. And everyone's like, what does it mean? And why are we, you know, these huge questions. And they walk away confused. But Jesus would rather have his disciples and followers walk away thinking than walk away assuming they know it all already. I want them to think. You have to understand the Jewish people, especially young Jews who've grown up in the synagogue and gone under rabbinical teachings, have been taught not only what to think, but how to think. There's a big difference between the two, but not only are they taught that, they're taught the other. Not just, here's what you think about God, eternity, um, the kingdom, the Messiah, the prophecies, the scriptures, but here's how we want you to think about those things too. I don't think our country is any different. Our children, in public and in private and in, in collegiate um, environments, are taught not just what to think, but how to think. We're taught, I feel like there's this like new era of, um, and we'll get to it a little bit later too, but there's this new era of like this deconstruction of faith that is, that is arising all throughout our country. And we have what we call the ex-evangelical movement. We have all these young millennials or younger who grew up in church and who are like, I don't believe that anymore. And we're leaving in, in mass numbers and we're terrifying all of the, the Gen Xers and, and, and the boomers ahead of us who are leading churches going, where did all the young people go? And it's this huge conversation going on. But here is what I believe is happening we have, from a young age, taught the people within our churches and sitting in our pews not only what to think, but how to think. And if everyone has been taught what to think and how to think, how to look at the scriptures, how to interpret it, how we're right and everyone else is wrong, when we get to an age where we go to college or get out in the world or experience life or hardship for the very first time, we realize there's a possibility we may be wrong on a few subjects. And if we're wrong on a few subjects, maybe we're wrong about all of the subjects. And so we begin to deconstruct. Well, what have I been taught? 
Did I think that for myself or did somebody teach that for me? And what we end up with are these silo churches or entire denominations and probably one for our country is a big, um, trying to be kind and, and thoughtful about this, but where we have a big nationalist environment where everyone looks the same, dresses the same, votes the same, acts the same, thinks the same, and believes the same. And so if anyone within the church, the big C church, is different than us, then they're dangerous. And that's scary. And so we have this huge conundrum, this great exodus of people leaving because they're not so sure that what they've been taught and how they've been taught to think is right. I grew up in an environment in church where what we believe is right, and if someone believes different, they're wrong. And as I've grown in the faith and studied more scripture and my own theology has evolved and I've had my own encounters with God and I've thought thoughts for myself, I realize there are people out there within the big C church who are different than I am and that's okay. That's a difficult thing to swallow when you grow up being taught if they're different, they're wrong. What if, if they're different, they're just different. They think differently, they perceive differently, they've interpreted differently. God can use anybody, not just me. So the master is teaching in his parables. He intends to keep people thinking. I believe there's three main reasons Jesus speaks in parables. One, he's trying to draw us out of the crowd and into a thoughtful relationship with him. A crowd is not a community, and a crowd is not discipleship. That's exactly what happens. He tells the big story to the crowd, and it says, and the twelve and those who were with them pull Jesus aside and like, Jesus, what did you mean? That's the intention. The intention is that when you read the word of God, when you read the grand story of who Jesus is in the Gospels, is that you do feel a little puzzled, and you feel a little confused. Why? So you can go then alone with God and go, Jesus, what do you mean? To go deeper into relationship with him. I think so much of the metrics of the American church are how big we are, how wide and expansive our reach is, how many numbers. I went to, I, I, I go to quite often like pastors gatherings and whatnot, and I stopped for a long time because they annoyed me. But, but the first question I get is how big is your church? How many people do you have in the seats? Like butts in the seats is the metric of success in the American church. One person said, we could be three miles wide and one inch deep in the church. Now my metric, when people ask me, how's your church or how big is your church? I don't even answer the question. I just go, um, we're healthy and we love each other and we're all up in each other's business. <laughs> and we eat all the time. <laughs> like that for me is depth and richness. Reach is not greater than depth. I think the other reason Jesus gives the parables is to give more little pieces, more little palatable bites of this kingdom that he's about to usher in. Because if he gave it all to the disciples right then and there, they would be so confused and probably so disappointed that they wouldn't have continued to follow. We get some little bits and pieces over his three years of ministry so that one day, in fact, he tells them, you don't understand this now, but one day it'll all make sense. One day it'll all come together. He uses parables to piece together what the kingdom is like so that eventually they can see it for what it is. Third reason, he's also, and I think the parable is perfect for it, he is separating those who are hard-hearted from those who are ready to receive. Here is the problem with the parable of the sower. I don't need to expound on it. We don't need to go verse by verse through it. We don't need to break down the Greek or the Hebrew. The problem with the parable of the sower is that it is plain and easy to understand. You don't need to explain it we don't need to, to break this down. He's speaking in plain language. And then he goes and explains it. Okay, the path of the road. Okay, the rocky. You get scorched. Okay, you got thorns. You got things in your life that don't belong. It's going to choke you out. It's going to strangle you. It's going to smother you. And if you're good soil, you'll bear fruit. 
And he's separating people to say, some of you, no matter how good the seed, the seed is not the variable, the soil is the variable. No matter how good the seed, how good the story, how good the message I'll give you, if your heart is hard, you won't receive it. You have pre-made up your mind not to hear anything I have to say. But if you have good soil, then you'll bear fruit. It's that simple. Mark Twain put it this way. It ain't the parts of the Bible that I can't understand that bother me. It is the parts that I do understand. It's the parts where God says, do this and don't do that. But no, 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 no. Let's get into all the idiosyncrasies and, and nuances of the end times. Let's talk about the book of Revelation. You know, like, let's get into stuff that's so confusing and so ethereal and so ambiguous that we can sit here and talk about it for days and days and days and days and days and ignore the fact that Jesus said plainly and purely, love your neighbor. Be good to your enemies. Feed them. Whatever you do to the least of these, you're doing to me. When you pray, pray like this and not like that. It's the plain language of Jesus that terrifies us. Because the plain language of Jesus leads us deeper and deeper into thought. Barclay put it this way. So Jesus spoke in his parables. He meant them to flash into people's minds and to illuminate the truth of God. But in so many eyes, he saw dull incomprehension. He saw so many people blinded by prejudice, deafened by wishful thinking, or too lazy to think. He turned to his disciples and he said, do you remember what Isaiah once said? He said that when he came with God's message to God's people, Israel, in his day, they were so duly ununderstanding that you would have thought that God had shut instead of opening their minds. I feel like that today. When Jesus said this, he didn't say in anger or irritation or bitterness or exasperation. He said it with the wistful longing of frustrated love, the poignant sorrow of a man who had a tremendous gift to give, which people were too blind to take. The sower wasn't the bias. The soil was. It's the parts of the Bible that I get that are plain and simple. Either of what Jesus has for me takes root in my heart and bears fruit for everyone else to enjoy, or it doesn't. And that means that my heart is hardened or too busy with weeds or too shallow for depth, for richness, for multiplication. The question for most of us isn't, God, why aren't you moving? Why aren't you speaking? Why aren't you using me? Why can't I hear you? Why can't I feel you? Why is this so difficult? Because we want to blame it on the sower. <laughs> Instead of recognizing maybe God's not speaking, moving, and doing because the soil of your heart is just not good. And so let's move on to something else, right? Let's move on to something deeper. Let's go into another Bible study or let's leave the church altogether because if you want me to face me, that is a whole other conversation. Does the message that Jesus gives, regardless of when he speaks it in the gospel or the great message, the great story that is strewn throughout the entire Bible, does it sit on the surface of your heart or is it deep, deep down inside? Will it withstand the weeds the persecution, the trial, the things that nobody plans for. Do you have a root system? Is it deep or is it shallow? My greatest fear for the American church is how shallow we've become. Our bookshelves are full with five easy ways to follow Jesus. <laughs> we, we literally have entire app systems and bookstores filled with abbreviated texts. I ordered one by accident. I was like, oh, I want to read this book. And I got it. And it was like this thin. And I'm like, why are you so thin? And I look at the back, it's abbreviated. I'm like, well, who wants that? 
It says 30 minutes or less. Why? We want everything as easy as it can come. We want the podcast. Give me 30 minutes of a podcast. Give me something simple, something I can digest. You know, my my son's asking me these great questions about heaven and God and eternity and and what happens when you die. And I'm like, put on Spider-Man because we can handle Spider-Man. Our, our, our whole culture is overwhelmingly consumed with the shallow, the filters on our Instagrams, the two lines we get for a bio, the timer we put on when we meet somebody new, the weather conversations seem to be about as deep as we get nowadays. Because we've been told what to think and how to think and who to trust and who not to. Put ourselves in echo chambers of people who believe and look and act and vote the exact same way we do. And the message of Jesus sits right on the surface because there's where we can handle it. That's the kind of Jesus. He's a good teacher. He was a great prophet. I think he was a good man. He carried a great message of love and acceptance and forgiveness. But nobody wants to read the other sides of the story where Jesus is like, we're going to get to a story where he's like separating the chaff from the wheat and throwing things into the fire and pruning things that don't bear fruit and talking about a place that, 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 that the worm does not die and the fire does not quench. I'm like, okay, Jesus, let's go back to the sower. Like that was hard, but let's go back. This is too much. This is, this is too deep. This is, this is a depth that I don't know if I can breathe in. And because we are so surface level, my fear and your fear should be that we might miss Jesus. I'm all for the five minute Devo in the morning. I'm all for the the verse of the day. It pops up on my watch usually sometime during church. But when is the last time you picked up a book that intimidated you? One of my pastor friends was, was retiring and and he called me to his office to help him pack up his office. And he had a, he had a, a kind of another alternative for me. He goes, I actually called you here because I wanted you to be able to just pick out some of the books before I, you know, put them away. And I'm like, okay. And where did my eye get drawn to? Like the simple books, like Simply Jesus, which is actually a very deep book. It's not a, it's not a, it's, that's not a simple book. But I'm like, okay, what's the, you know, five minute, three ways to grow your church and, you know, whatever. Like I wanted to pick those books out. And as I started to pick them up, I was like, what am I doing? So then I was like, okay, Ray, you know what you want. You know what you like. I was like, Greek orthodox you know and i was just like this is like the history of the fathers of the faith you know and i picked up this one book i don't even know what it's about it was in, i was like i'm gonna i'm gonna try it let's give it an idea i get to the first page and i'm like i don't know what that word is i'm like i need a thesaurus and a, and a synonym finder and a dictionary next to me and i'm like i need that why because if i don't think for myself i'll miss what jesus is trying to do in and through me I'll miss it completely. I think the big thing that Jesus was trying to do for the Jewish people and why it's in the word of God and what he's trying to speak to you and I today on the other side of the planet 2,000 years later is that you and I need to be able to think for ourselves, to ponder for ourselves, to struggle, to chew on the words of God and of scripture and not take everything at surface Level Our churches are full of alliteration and rhymes and cute titles. And, and I've been susceptible to that over the years because we feel like, okay, let's just give them just enough of Jesus. A seven-minute sermon, you win. You can do it. Make sure you stop by the tithe box on the way out, right? Like, we want those things because it's simple. But when is the last time you picked up a podcast or opened up a book or read a book of Scripture? Like, go read, like, Lamentations or Ezekiel. Like, Ezekiel sees this like wheel flying up in space like a spaceship and I skip over that passage every time because I'm like I don't know what that means why are we so afraid of the deep things and not even just spiritual ways we're we're afraid of of deep things in ourselves therapy is like like a bad word in the church to go deep relationally to go deep Date night is intimidating to so many married couples because we don't have the kids to distract us. And I might have to look straight into her eyes for a few minutes to go deep. We want self-help. We want abbreviation. We want palatable. Because you and I, as human beings, flee 
from what we cannot understand. And then there's Jesus, who stands on a boat in the Sea of Galilee with an enormous crowd gathered, mainly to see him heal and to hear how eloquent he is and to maybe get some free food because he's been doing that lately. And some of, some of them are there just because it's popular. Others are there because they hate him and they're taking notes for his trial down the road. And instead of giving them what they all want, he gives them what they really need. Let me confuse the heck out of you so that you can all walk away thinking for yourself. Thinking for yourself. Not being told what to think and not being taught how to think, but think for yourself. Jesus consistently operates on a different level, dimension, and depth. And if you and I are always on the surface, we'll miss Jesus every single day. He is in the deep things. He's in the confusing things. My kids are, were raising up caterpillars to become butterflies, and they had this little thing in the house, and I'm terrified of bugs, so I was just <laughs> annoyed and annoyed about it. But they were so fascinated by by this caterpillar worm, which are not as cute as they are in the books, and, and the cocoon, which kind of looks like something bad, and then like they're flying, and they're releasing, and then they're crying because the butterfly's gone, and I'm just like, that is such a good lesson. They're getting to see a metamorphosis, a complete transformation. That's the moment for conversation. I love that Jesus is like, let me tell you about the deepest, grandest, most amazing things in all of the world and of all of human history and of all of eternity. And let me throw it right next to this story that you can just understand. Because he wants us to get it too. Jesus doesn't want us to stay confused. He wants us to get it and to receive it. It's like a woman who loses the coin. It's like a dad whose son goes off. It's like a shepherd who loses his sheep. What is he trying to, to get us to understand? God desires us. And story after story and parable after parable on these different dimensions and levels and depths, Jesus speaks. Don't let the message of Jesus sit on the surface of your heart. Don't let it not go beneath the surface. Allow yourself, in fact, plan for yourself to go into deep thought, deep consideration, contemplation, deep relationships and connections with other people and with Jesus, deep into God's word. Don't be afraid to be intimidated or confused. I love what Paul said to the church in Ephesus, in the first chapter. Of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. Listen to the way he describes his relationship and hopefully their relationship with God. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I've not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Listen to his prayer for this church. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation. Those are deep words for deep relationship so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart, I mean, even just that phrase, I don't have eyes on my heart, but the Bible says I do. The eyes of my heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. Listen, the riches, you could translate that depth, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. The power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when Christ, when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly realms far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is invoked, not only in this present age, but also in the one to come. In six short verses, Paul has talked about glory, enlightenment, inheritance, depth, holiness, incomparably great power, faith, belief, mighty strength, resurrection, heavenly realms. When was the last time you used the word realm in everyday language? 
far above all rule, authority, power, dominion, and every name invoked, not only in the present age, but in one that is yet to come. We are talking about some very big ideas. I wonder why we don't tattoo verses like that on our sleeves. <laughs> don't be afraid of the deep. Don't be afraid of what we can't understand. God is often working in the places you and I are afraid of. In the deep relationships, in the deep work of therapy, in, in the deep scriptures, in deep quiet and contemplation. My prayer life, oh my gosh, it's the quiet moments that are terrifying. Can anybody agree? Because I, I like it, I'm like, God, thank you for this, and thank you for that. And if you don't mind doing this, and I'm sorry about that. But it's those moments where it's just me and God in silence, where it's like, okay, I need to say something or do something. This is getting uncomfortable, you know? Like I'm sitting in an uncomfortable silence with God, and all of a sudden, there he is. All of a sudden, he's like, I just needed you to come a little further, a little deeper. I needed you to go a little bit, set your roots down a little bit more. I needed you to separate from all the things you understand and walk confidently hand in hand with my son Jesus into the unknown and watch what I can say and do. Watch the way you'll read scriptures from now on when you go, I'm not afraid of what I cannot understand. Because in that somewhere, Jesus has a word for me. So we're not going to break down the parable. You're going to go home and do that for yourself. Let's do some of our own thinking, our own contemplation. And my prayer for you is that God would speak to you in ways as you ask questions maybe you're not used to asking or thoughts you're not used to thinking or confusion that you're uncomfortable with. Watch what God does in those moments. Because I believe that we have on the surface missed out on so much of the heart of God because we are intimidated by what we do not know. Let's pray. Jesus, forgive us for being lazy to think. Forgive us for the times we just want to unplug. and not, We don't want to think right now. We don't want to tackle that right now. We just need to zone out or move on or get out of whatever. I, God, I pray that those moments of uncomfortableness with our children or conversations or as we, as we examine our own lives and our hearts and our histories, or maybe we meet a new person or begin a new relationship or sit down in a church with the Bible in our laps. God, I pray that we would not turn away from those moments of depth, but that we would, like you said in the beginning of your parable, listen and lean in. We would lean into you that we would see things maybe we never saw before, hear things we, we should have heard all along, that you would change our hearts and our minds not to look more and more like those around us, but to look more and more like your son, Jesus, who operates in a whole, whole other realm and dimension. His thoughts are higher. His ways are higher. You are incomprehensible, but yet you want us to know you personally. God, give us the grace to deal with people around us, the patience to love those who are difficult to love. God, work on the soil of our hearts. May we be the kind of people who when the seed is thrown, when your word is cast upon us and your message is here, that we produce fruit, that we put down roots, that we have gotten rid of the weeds that would choke us or the, the rocky ground of our hearts that has been hardened that we would let you in in ways that we haven't before. In Jesus' name, and everybody said together, amen, amen. amen. A few things before you skedaddle. Is next week Mother's Day? Wow, that came fast. If anybody has any good ideas for Mother's Day presents, let me know. Um, Mother's Day, uh, Pastor Rachel is preaching. We're going to have flowers. It's, we call it Bring Your Mom to Church Day. So we'll have some flowers for them and some refreshments. And then we put up a photo booth. And you can take a family photo with mom. That's next Sunday. And then the 15th is breakfast in the garden. And we'll feed everybody and hang out together. And then after that, we'll probably move to dinner in the garden because it's going to get hot. So we'll go at like sunset time and, and have a little bit more of a vibe outside in the garden. Um, if you need prayer, counseling, a friend, if you want to just go into some deeper conversations, 
talk to one of us or go to anx.life and submit a request to meet with a pastor. We'd love to just go deep, ask the hard questions, and we'll probably tell you we don't know the answers to most of them, and that's okay. We don't need to shy away from that. Uh, we love you. Have a great week.